Good evening. Welcome to Elmore Church of Christ. This is our Wednesday night Bible study. It's so good to have everyone here tonight. That's not going to work. <laughs> Sorry. Um, this is our Wednesday night Bible class. Uh, we have any visitors here tonight. You're our honored guest. Thank you for being here. We will be continuing the study that Jimmy Davis is doing on modern day miracles. On our sick list, we want to continue to remember Tim Buck had rotator cuff surgery this past Monday, and it all went great. He's at home recovering. We'll keep him in our prayers. And, of course, our sweet sister, Alice Stewart, we want to continue to pray for her as she continues with her treatments. And Brad Vera continues to be in Jackson Hospital, so we want to continue to remember him. Holly Smith's mother, Shannon Sharp, uh, remains in Jackson Hospital, so we want to continue to remember her. Uh, we, we support a preacher up in Endless Mountain Church of Christ in uh, Pennsylvania, and Jimmy Davis is going to be giving you an update. He's uh, been deathly ill here recently, so Jimmy will give you an update on that. And continue to remember that our, uh, we, our next service will be an adult Bible class at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning, followed by the 10 a.m. worship. At this time, we'll have no children's classes on Sunday or Wednesday. Daniel Albright, it's good to have him back with us tonight. Uh, they found a little place on his arm that uh, has had some skin cancer removed before, and it's come back. So they're going to go in on June the 2nd and remove some more skin cancer on his arm, and his next appointment for his knee is on the 11th of June. So let's continue to uh, keep Daniel in your prayers. Jeannie Carlisle will be taking some of the children out to the trailer uh, during service tonight, so be prepared for that. Are there any other announcements that we need to make? And, uh, Jeannie is also younger than All right, 10 years old and younger, uh, as soon as we finish with the prayer, y'all will follow Jeannie out to the trailer out there. Again, our service will have a prayer next, to, and then as soon as the prayer is over with, uh, Jimmy Davis will start our class. One quick correction, um, Brad Vara is in Baptist South, Baptist South, and I talked with him today, and he was so weak he couldn't hardly carry on a conversation more than three or four words, and he'd, he'd be uh, long, sometimes as much as a minute before he could say anything else. So he is so weak, and uh, he just definitely needs our, needs our prayers, and <clears throat> maybe some other ways that we might just let him know we care, a card or something. So pray with me, please. Great and holy God, we just praise you for being the great God that you are. Lord, we know that you are the creator of the universe and all things that are therein. You give us all good and perfect gifts, and all things that you give us, Lord, are good. And we pray that you would help us to recognize the wonder and the beauty of the things that you've given us here, but to recognize also, Lord, that they are but a glimpse of what you can and will give us in eternity. We thank you, Lord, that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die. He came and he lived with all the things that he lived with here, of the horrors of this life, and especially the horrors of his death, Lord. And he did that for me. And he did it for all that are in here and all that, that hear these words. And Lord, we just uh, we pray that you would help us to just live our life in such a way so that uh, uh, we can show our appreciation for you and for Jesus and for the Holy Spirit as he works in our life. And we thank you for each of these. Lord, there are many that are sick and hurting, 
Uh, we're thankful that Tim Buck was able to go through his surgery and do well. And we pray that you would continue to be with him through his recovery process and that you will uh, help him to be uh, uh, at a minimum pain level so that he can function and do things and just enjoy life. And Lord, we, we pray that uh, you will be with Daniel Albright and uh, having the knee surgery, Lord, and uh, still having a lot of pain from that. And we just pray that you would bless him and that you give him some relief of this pain. And Ken and Maureen, Maureen, uh, going through so much, Lord, and know that uh, her pain level is, is high sometimes, and they just can't seem to find it. And Ruth Beasley and others, Lord, that uh, go through so much here, and thankful that Don's having some relief from his pain. But we ask your continued blessings on him, that he'll be able to... Uh, He'll be able to uh, just get even better, Lord, that you would just heal his body. Uh, Lord, there is, uh, as was mentioned, those such as Brad Vara and Alice and, and others who have these extended, very serious sicknesses, we just especially pray for them that if it's your will, you will heal their bodies we're so thankful, Lord, that uh, the things that we go through here in this life are temporary. And that one day we'll have that beautiful home in heaven where we'll not have the pain and the agony and we won't deal with death or any of the things here, Lord, that bring us pain. And we pray, Lord, that you would uh, uh, be with those such as Jeff White, uh, preacher there in Tonkanic, uh, in the Endless Mountains Church there, uh, just such a, so, so much sickness here with the pneumonia and uh, other issues there with his, his breathing and lungs. And Lord, we're just so thankful that he's doing some better, but we also know that uh, it's a ways to go. And we pray your blessing to be upon him. And we pray that you would uh, be with his family and others, Lord, that... Uh, he may have been in contact with that might uh, be able to take some of that uh, various sicknesses that he has or others that would be going around and we just pray that you'd be with them Lord through this and those with the World Bible School Lord we know there are many that uh, are um, they they have family members that are sick and some with this coronavirus and, and uh, Lord we know that uh, there's been those in our area who have uh, conducted that and have, have had this. And uh, Lord made aware recently of the police department uh, in Montgomery who's had uh, so much exposure and so many of that it, that have actually uh, contracted it that uh, uh, they've been short on, on people to work. And uh, they've had to have people work in places they wouldn't normally work. And we pray your blessings to be upon them as they work in those areas they're not quite as familiar with. And Lord, uh, there's no doubt are, are situations all over this world that are similar to that. And just help us to remember that you're in control of all things. None of this caught you by surprise. All of this is something that you'll work together for good. And just help us, Lord, as we think about it, that we'll have a peace that passes all understanding. And we will appreciate the fact that uh, there's much learning that can be done from this. And there are many people that can and will be drawn to you because of this situation. Help us to be prepared and to follow through with uh, just uh, doing the things that will bring people uh, and to you and, and we'll just uh, uh, use the venues that we have now got uh, the the situations that we have learned the things we've learned and just help us to use them wisely as Lord but so that uh, more people will be brought to you we just thank you in that we we thank you Lord that uh, you've been with us through our search for a new minister we say thank you so much for Don thank you for Judy and Jordan uh, what they have mean, meant and continue to mean in their lives. 
And uh, we thank you, Lord, that you've been with us through this search. And we just ask for continued guidance and wisdom as we move forward with this, Lord. And thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. One or two more announcements we'd like to make. One is concerning Jeff Wythe at uh, Duncanic. He has uh, had a bad night last night. His fever got up to 106. <clears throat> uh, but it seems like that was the, kind of the, the, the rough night. He, this, this morning he's much better. His breathing's better, but he's still a very sick guy. Jeff is a diabetic. That complicates everything as you know, but he's also septic. Both lungs are filled with pneumonia, very serious. So he has a long way to go, but he is much, much better. He does not have COVID virus. Uh, the test they did Monday uh, came back negative. He was just checked the week before it was negative. And this, so hopefully uh, he's not dealing with that virus also. So just keep Jeff and uh, brethren up there in your prayers. One good announcement I have tonight is uh, Brother Scott Gleaves and Sherry will be coming on board with us. Scott will be our preacher. He said that due to other commitments, they can't be here this Sunday, but hopefully by the 31st they'll be able to be with us at that point starting his ministry here. He still has some other uh, commitments that he's working on. He's trying to reschedule and change all of that, but uh, uh, they're looking forward to being with us. So if not the 31st and for sure the first Sunday in June, uh, uh, Scott and Sherry will be with us. And uh, probably be some more that will, <laughs> that will be with us at uh, would be some new members to us. They would be uh, uh, well-seasoned Christians, and I know they'll be a, a big help to us here. Uh, the, this book, uh, how, how we're studying, you realize that I'm not against you asking questions in our interaction, but keep in mind the only sound anyone uh, at home can hear is what comes through this mic. If you ask a question, Unless you come and ask it through the mic, they wouldn't know the question. I'd have to repeat the question and so forth and so on. So after saying that, if you have a question about something, if you'll let me know after the class, I'll try to address it uh, the next week. But I do have some extra books. I say extra books. If anyone raised your hand last Wednesday and didn't get a book, let me know. Did anyone raise your hand and you didn't get your book yet? Stan? Right, Judy, would you? I'll get to it. But I have, I, I still have two or three books here. Jonathan, I, I got some more. I, I don't know if they'll probably be in before next week. I think I got it. No, that was the last one. These, these books are, are rather inexpensive, but uh, they are, it is good reading, even if you're not uh, getting all of this in the class, but it is, it is some excellent reading. I, uh, I, I want to make sure that uh, we're not, I'm not confusing you on what I believe concerning miracles. I believe that each one of us in, in the auditorium could testify either events that happened in our own life or someone very close to us that was involved in an event that when you look back and look at that event, you say, that just couldn't have happened that way other than the fact that God was involved. And I, I, I'm not 
taken away from that at all. I believe God works in our lives. I believe that God directs the hand of the surgeon or enhances the medication or makes that tornado pick up and jump somebody's house or change directions. I believe God uses the events that's going on in our life and in our world for his intentions. And so this is not to say that that's not happening and that is currently going on and will continue. But the subject that we are really dealing with, let me, let me read that again the way uh, Brother Miller uh, phrases it because let's don't lose the fact that this study is concerning the miracles of this modern age. And this is what we're looking at. This entire study basically covers these subjects. The biblical definition of miracles, the, the Bible's stated purpose of miracles, how long God intended miracles to last, the rule of tongue, or role of tongue speaking, the purpose of Holy Spirit baptism. Now, many of these subjects we will get into as we go along, okay? So if you have a question, it will probably be answered as we get a little deeper into the study. Whether apostles exist today. Some people claim they're, they're apostles. Do they, are they really? What's the definition of apostle and so forth? What does it mean to be spiritual? Most people say that they speak in a tongue, it's a sign of their, they have a special spirituality or God is directing them or God is allowing them to be more spiritual than someone else. And uh, this study is dealing with those subjects. And it, tonight we're starting on page 8. So if you have your books, we're on, the, on page 8. Hopefully we'll complete chapter 13 and next week begin chapter 4. So tonight we're, we're picking up where we ended last week on page 8. Miracles was to authenticate the oral spoken word as God's word. Miracles legitimized and verified the teaching of God's messengers as they were dealing with so many people roaming around the countryside teaching all sorts and manner of doctrines. and Well, that happens today, doesn't it? <laughs> you remember Pharaoh's magicians could do certain things, couldn't they? A lot of people today can fool a lot of people. And uh, is that, that's been going on since time began. How about the uh, God uh, authenticates the men sent by him by the use of these miracles. That's the purpose of them. Consider two examples. Using the parallel term works, it's a key like a sign, in the book of John. John remarked to Philip, do you not believe that I am, Jesus remarked to Philip, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? Question. The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Or else believe, believe me for the sake of the works that I do. John 14, 10 through 11 and other places. How about Nicodemus? When Nicodemus said to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God for no one can do these signs, again, miracles, that you do unless God is with him. John 3, 2. This pattern is repeated in the New Testament many times over in John and all through, especially all through John, but Acts and other places. In other words, Jesus performed signs and miracles to prove his divinity, to prove that he was from God. And by God, he was doing these miracles. Here, here is a considered consistent sequence as, as we read about miracles, signs, and wonders throughout the scriptures. Signs confirm the word, as we said, 
the spoken word was represented to, was presented to hearers. You don't like getting someone's attention. If you if you brought someone who's been dead for three or four days from the grave, that would get your attention, would it? Or if you know this person is dead and they walk coming out of the city, going to the take this person to the cemetery, and you stop the the uh, procession and had that person to come alive again, it'd get your attention, would it? Or someone that you know was deathly ill. And just a spoken word from miles away. And the time you spoke it, many miles away, that person was healed. It would get people's attention. People followed Jesus around. They believed and heard about these miracles. And so it, it was, God was using the miracles to show that this Jesus of Nazareth, this carpenter's son, was not just a man. He was a God-man. And God was with him. So, the faith was created by the word, by these, these miracles. An excellent demonstration of this process is provided by Luke in his report of the conversion of the Roman proconsul Ser Sergius Paulus. Now, Ilmus, the sorcerer, attempted to draw Paul, or he attempted to do something and copy Paul. He is... is uh, convincing as Paul was when he tried to do the miracles. Uh, but Paul's efforts to teach uh, uh, Sergius the gospel, Paul was doing miracles and doing things and saying things. And, and this uh, really got the sorcerer's attention. And then when, when uh, uh, the Apostle Paul pronounced a curse upon o o Elimus, and it happened immediately. It really got the pro council's attention, didn't it? And I, as far as I know, and that was the first Christian, or I'm sure he obeyed the gospel at that point. But again, a, another example in Luke, in Acts, concerning the use of a miracle to confirm that Paul was preaching the true word of God. One might, one might well expect the text to have said that Sergius was astonished at the miracle that Paul performed, but Luke was careful to report the situation with precision. The miracle that Paul performed captured Sergius' attention, causing him to recognize the divine origin of Paul's gospel message. Now, once Paul or Jesus or any of the apostles would do a miracle that people knew was a miracle, They, as Jesus said, if you have an ear, hear what I have to say, it got their attention. Some of us, sometimes we have to, somebody had to slap us with a cold fish in the face to get our attention. But, well, that what really happened, and that was a purpose of getting people to pay attention to what was being said. The gospel message, in turn, generated faith in the proconsul. In harmony with Paul's later affirmation to Christians in Rome that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The uh, uh, super spiritual. Now when people imply and try to fool people into thinking they have a supernatural ability that some, someone else does not have, they are special and God's approval, then they try to fool people in doing some type of a miracle. Well, we know uh, how, and it's been, it's been investigated and proven. The people that come on stage, when you look back at their life and look back at their background, it's been proven that they, it was staged. No one has been able to authenticate a, really, a real miracle yet from any faith healer. It's always some type of ailment that it's not visible. Uh, and, and, of course, that's what they but maintain. But some maintain that there are other reasons for divine healing and tongue speaking. Some say tongue speaking is a sign that the tongue speaker is super spiritual. Others say miraculous healing serves the purpose of making the believers well, a mere act of mercy to relieve his pain and suffering. They say God does not want us to suffer, so he will heal us just to ease our pain and suffering in, the, in this life because we are children. 
And we all love God and know he loves us. And, and we talked about this and studied about this. Why does good people suffer? We know God never promised us. If you'll follow me, if you'll obey me, your life's going to be easy. In fact, right the opposite was promised. If you follow me, you're going to be, you're going to have family strife. You'll have mother against daughter, father against son. It's, that's just the way life is, and that happens. So, no, God never promised us a life of ease. He never promised us a life without sickness, pain, and suffering. In fact, he's, what he really promised was you're going to live life like anyone else. But I want you to trust me, and I want you to be faithful to me. Not only will you have a home in heaven, but you're going to be an example to others. Regarding the first claim, Paul, in Paul's admonitions directed to the church of Christ at Corinth, he insisted that the person who possessed the ability to speak in tongues was not, was not super spiritual to the, one who had, uh, uh, to the one who had no such ability. You aren't any better, Paul said, than if you'd speak in a tongue, well, good for you. But you're no better, you're no more spiritual than someone that can't speak in a tongue. Paul said, I can speak in more tongues than you all. So, when, but then we know human nature. The tongue speaker had a responsibility to utilize his gift appropriately to aid others in recognizing his miraculous ability to serve, to authenticate the divine message he communicated. Again, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 13 and 14 all deal with that. His gift no more placed him in a spiritual superior position than did any other gift possessed by any other member. Whether the ability was to prophesy, to whatever the ability might be. Uh, you know, God bestowed these gifts on people, the Holy Spirit did, as he, as he knew they would use the ability for what? Teaching the gospel. What about uh, other, other purposes to make well? Regarding the second claim that we had talked about, certainly the compassion of God was evident. When Jesus healed someone, you know, what was it five? Was it five lepers? Uh, ten lepers? You know, how many come back to thank him? <laughs> One. I know the other nine was happy, wasn't they? Oh, they had to be. They, they, they were probably jumping up with joy and running to tell all the neighbors, family, and friends, but only one took the time to come back and thank Jesus. So, so we know human nature. We know human nature. And it's just sometimes we, we forget to, to be thankful. But the compassion of God was evident when people received miraculous healing in the New Testament. And surely relief from suffering would, would have been a sign or effect, the benefit of being healed. But the Bible teaches that relieving suffering was not the purpose of miracles. Such a purpose uh, would be contradictory if that was God's purpose. The divine intent of this created earth as a place where hardship exists is to prepare us for eternity. Death and sin entered the world due to human choice. And God allows the circumstances caused by human decisions take their course. Someone said, well, I've repented, and that's a wonderful thing. I've changed, and that's great. I've obeyed the gospel, that's wonderful. God loves me, I'm, a, I'm saved, I'm looking forward to a heavenly home, that's great. That's the benefit of being a Christian. But what about your past life? Does that mean that you can wash all of that away and the people you affected in your past life? No, no. No, that's still there. You still have the repercussions of your bad decisions are still there. But as far as your relationship with God is what we're talking about. That's where salvation is. That's a wonderful thing. You still need to rectify your past mistakes as much as possible. Some you can't. Obviously, people may have died, moved away. You don't know where they are. So that's just part of life. And it happens that way. The, the Christian is subject to the same diseases, same tragedies, the same physical death that befalls non-Christians. 
For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Genesis 3.19. The Bible, in fact, warns Christians that they can expect to be the recipients of hardships, be opposed, temptation, and suffering. In fact, turn to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 4. I want to read this, this scripture because I think it makes an excellent point. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 17. Again, keep in mind that we are talking about suffering for God's glory. Chapter 12, Peter, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing had happened to you. Don't blame God. Don't think that because I'm a Christian now, none of this should be happening to me and blame God. Does Satan use those trials to make people turn away to turn away from God and to turn to him or to start or to blame God or lose their faith? It's one of Satan's strongest tools. You know people and I do too that have allowed tragedy to to make them in some cases turn and away from God or even blame God. But rejoice to the extent that you partake that you partake of Christ sufferings that when his glory is revealed you may also be glad with exceeding joy it's going to be a wonderful thing brethren to not have to worry about arthritis cancer COVID virus all these other ailments we deal with in this life it's going to be a wonderful thing not to have to deal with it any longer it would be to be a, in, a, in a place where there's no crying, no suffering. My joints don't wear out. I don't have to worry about having skin cancers removed every few months. That's in heaven. That's our reward. That's the home we're looking for. He goes on to say, if, if you, verse 14, are appro- reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. Instead of, instead of blaspheming and, and talking or blaming God, you should be glorifying God. I know that's hard to do, isn't it? Look at Job. Why that story of Job in the Bible? But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. I love that verse. But let him glorify God in this matter. Verse 17. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel? Uh, of of God, that was, that's going to be a sad day, brethren. When someone stands before God is not even tried to obey the gospel, they have, God's not part of their life. They don't want Him part of their life. They had He made an attempt. They're going to stand before God without any type of, of excuse, and it's going to happen to a lot of people, unfortunately. What about the uh, to say that they were wrought, and this is going back to this reading, for the single purpose of showing divine compassion towards your sick and those op- oppressed by the devil would be to ignore the, a purpose which is easily discerned, which is openly avowed by Christ himself and which is of much greater importance. The purpose was to support his proclamation, a necessary proof for the claim of Jesus. So when people try to say, well, if God loves us, he's going to keep us from suffering. He's going to, he's going to keep us from uh, uh, temptation and trial and tribulations. No, that's not true. He, he, know, he will supply us a way of escape. According to the Corinthian letter, I think it's 2 Corinthians 5, 12. 
If God's intention was to exempt Christians from sickness and disease, he certainly has fallen down on the job. Do we suffer as Christians? Oh, yeah. Right now, a lot of us are suffering. So if God's intent, once we become his child, was to keep these diseases and these things from happening to us, God has failed. But we know that's not his intention. Vast, since the vast majority of Christians throughout the last 2,000 years have experienced the same affliction suffered by unbelievers, if miracles in the first century had, had as their object to improve the health of, of, and physical well-being of the subject, it, 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 of the recipient, then, then Jesus and the apostles were failures because they left untouched a lot of sick and dying people. Jesus healed a minority, not a majority, of sick people in Palestine. And healed none outside of the tiny geographical region with the exception of the Canaanite woman's daughter. So as we look at really what was going on in the first century, one would be forced to conclude that God's compassion did not extend to everybody. But the Bible affirms that God loves the entire world. John 3.16 in Romans 5.8. Hence, miracles did not, lead, did not have as their central purpose to demonstrate God's compassion nor to ease pain, sickness, and suffering. Um, uh, Brother McGarvey said this, Unlike these modern advocates of divine healing, the apostles were never known to go about exhorting people to come forward for the healing of the body. They, they affected uh, miraculous cures, no doubt, in a few instances as a sign of, uh, to unbelievers, but they never proclaimed either to saints or sinners that the healing of all diseases was a part of the gospel. When they preached to someone, they didn't promise them. If they'd come and obey the gospel, confess Jesus as Lord and be baptized, that they'd be healed. That never was in the gospel message. Never was intended to be. These so-called faith cure churches, therefore, and their preachers who uh, officiate in them or as divine healers or whatnot, are not modeled after the apostolic age or type but are misleading people by humbugging and humgoing. That's what Brother McGarvey said. The usual rebuttal to these observations is that the reasons some people do not believe or, or receive a miracle is they do not have sufficient faith. You talk to people about that. Well, why didn't you heal him? Oh, she wasn't healed. He wasn't. Well, and the, the faith healer, or the Pentecostal person would say, well, they just didn't have enough faith. I've heard that, and you have too. If you've talked to many, that's what they fall back on and say. But this objection is likewise unscriptural. It is true that some individuals in the New Testament were commended for their faith that they possessed prior to being recipients of the miracle. In Mark 5.34 is a good example. But it does not automatically follow, however, that faith was a necessary prerequisite to miraculous healing or the reception of a miracle. It never was, in, never was, never was uh, pointed to it. If you have enough faith, or you have to have enough faith to receive this miracle. We can prove that by examples and by scripture. Many people were not required to have faith as a prerequisite. For example, all individuals who were raised from the dead Obviously, was in a was not in a position to have faith. John eleven forty four. Nor did these those possessed by demons have faith before being healed, since they were out of their minds anyway. Luke nine forty two and, and and also Luke eleven talks about uh, 
the, the demon-possessed man. The man who was blind from birth actually showed uncertainty regarding the identity of Jesus. He, he was even wondering who he was. So we know he didn't have faith. John 9, example of that. The man who was healed by Jesus as he lay beside the pool of water. He didn't know who Jesus was. He didn't even know who healed him. John 5. On one occasion, Jesus healed a paralytic man after observing not his faith, but the faith of his companions. We don't know whether the cripple had faith or not, but his companions sure did. Mark 2. Additional texts indicate that many who received the benefits of miracles were not required to have faith. The opposite, in fact, the opposite is true as well. They were individuals who possessed faith, but yet did, were not healed of their ailments. If faith, your strong faith, meant you would be healed by your strong faith, then the Apostle Paul must not have had faith. What did Paul do? He had a thorn in the flesh. Evidently, it was a very serious ailment. Some think it was eyesight. And other, some might think he had malaria and other diseases, other things he suffered with, but it was, it was real. He prayed to God three times about it. God said, no. He didn't, he didn't remove that thorn of flesh. He just made Paul a promise. My faith is sufficient for you. You wonder, and I've wondered, and I know you have, why didn't he, why didn't he take that thorn away from Paul? He was such an effective man. You see, we don't know God's intentions all the time. We don't know why God maybe had led that surgeon's hand just right to where something happened or that was, wow. I don't know if the surgeon don't even know, but you know, he, he's doing better or whatever, or why that car just slightly just missed you by two inches instead of taking your life and all, all these things. That tornado just missed my house. So we don't know the intent of God. But God has a plan. I think God has a plan for every one of us. I think God spares us sometimes because he, he knows that we are people that have a, want to do what he wants us to do and we are, we are people that will allow him to use us. And I think in some cases he may spare our lives for future work that he will put before us. Yes, sir. In fact, uh, and Dallas is making a point, folks, that, uh, asking a question here and making a point. Some people uh, uh, that just they just want to obey God. They want to be close to God and have God close to them, and that's what they're seeking is to be closer to God. I think in Paul's instance, that this thorn in the flesh, whatever it was, God knew something about Paul. This that. God said, if I, take, if I remove this thorn of the flesh from this man, he will not be as effective. He will not be as dedicated as he would with it. So I think that's the reason. God, but this is all subjection, and we can make up our own mind about these things. But I think it's very true that we don't know God's plan. God, God, is, God knows things that we don't, and that's just the way it is. But I'm thankful for that because... 
God knows best. That's where faith comes in play. So let's have let's let's just trust in God. Lord, I don't understand why this is happening to me. I don't understand why you spared my life in this situation. But I do trust you. It is for my good. Turn right quick to Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter twelve. Second Corinthians chapter twelve. We're gonna to try to rush through this. Starting with verse 7. Now we, we'll, we'll read this. Where, where did I go? We, we know this account, but it's good to be reminded exactly what's going on here for just a minute. Starting in verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. So Paul had figured out what? God must have given me this thorn in the flesh because he wanted to keep me humble. Mac Davis had a song, It's Hard to Be Humble. Can't wait to wake up in the morning. I get better looking every day. Hey, sometimes I think things happen to us that God cuts us down or not to do. But that's, again, that's God's will. But this is what Paul says. A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. That was the main point I wanted to make that here. That Sometimes these things happen to us because God wants us to, to stay close to him and to seek him. As Alice said, he'll use these things against us. It may be something that, uh, again, the, that you, we don't understand why this is happening, but God does. Trust in, trust in him. Paul advised him to use a little wine. Remember, Timothy had a stomach problem. Paul advised him to use a little wine as a tonic, 1 Timothy 5, 23. Another Christian work, a companion of Paul in his evangelistic work, obviously, was, was Epiroditus. We know the story about him. Became sick and almost to death. But yet, didn't heal him. The... Uh, Matthew thirteen fifty eight. He did he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief, some people say. And he's talking about where? He's talking about going to his home country. Why didn't Jesus do all these miracles there? Because of their unbelief. Now I don't think that uh, the text is talking about they had to be strong believers before Jesus would work miracles there. I think I think Jesus Neglect or didn't perform the miracles in his home country because they didn't. They tried to everything to dishonor Jesus. They didn't want to hear. They weren't going to pay attention anyway. And Jesus knew that. And that's why. The, 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 but some people say again, this proves you have to have. You have to believe for Jesus to work in your life. No, oh, that's true. No, <laughs> huh? True. Now. Well, they, they believe and tremble, and some folks say that why don't the demons uh, obey the gospel if they believe and tremble? Because they, ha they, are, uh, they have a rebellious nature, that selfish, rebellious nature, and therefore they are, God's given them up to their own, uh, own rebellious nature. We're, uh, do, we're, we are not to suppose that uh, Jesus' power was limited to the to belief or unbelief of men, but they were so that were so prejudiced and set against Jesus. Jesus was simply doing what he was what he was instructed had instructed the twelve to do. Whatever you you whoever will not receive you nor hear you, shake off the dust of your feet. Matthew six eleven. We know what happened there. Uh, what about the elders? Now, our time is up, but uh, I, I, I did want to spend a little bit of time about James 5, verses 14 through 15. We don't have time to go into that, but I want you to read this account because this uh, has, I know, sitting in this audience, some brethren before an operation or before a major happening in their life would ask for the elders to pray with them and anoint them. 
I think it's a great idea. I, I, I think it's a good idea. I think it shows a matter of faith in God when we do that. And I'm sure not against it. I participated in doing that, not only once, but more than one time. But what does he really mean about that? That's, we'll, we'll pick that up next week because, again, we have run out of time. But mark that spot, and we'll pick up there. Uh, page 17, what about the elders? Does the elders have this miraculous ability? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing us with this day. We thank you for blessing us with this time together. We thank you for answering our prayers. Lord, we know that you love us, and we're just asking you, Lord, this very evening to increase our faith in you. Lord, help us to have the faith that we can accept whatever happens to us, even when calamity and when bad things happen to us, Lord, that we would glory in you, keep our mind on you that these things are happening and you have our best interest at heart, even when we can't understand it. But in the long run, what will be for our good, in a spiritual way and sometimes even in a physical way, you, you know and you will help us in that area and have faith in that. Just increase our faith, Lord. Increase our love for you and each other. We pray this through the man.